um, oh, hold on. I just came up with what it was. What was it? Ah, yes. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Natalie, also known as Nitty Natty. Welcome to episode 170 of the Love and Stitches podcast. Today is Tuesday, February something. I don't know the date, but I do know that it is the last podcast in February. And just a heads up, there will not be a podcast next week because we are going to be out of town traveling for the Knitting in the Hills retreat, but there will still be two videos next week, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday, and I'll explain that later on in the news segment. I have my hair up today because I have run out of dry shampoo. I'm not really sure if I like want to replace the brand that I got already or if I want to try something different. Uh, I really don't like how it leaves flakes and I think I might want to try something that's not a spray so I can kind of control more of it not getting on my skin. I don't know, it hasn't really been a problem. But anyway, if you want to suggest some dry shampoos for me in the comments, I will be definitely reading through those and taking you up on your advice. I have really straight hair and it gets greasy like this pretty much by the end of the day. So yes, if your hair type is like that, let me know what you use to combat it so you can wash your hair less often. Anyway, so like I got a haircut last week and I love my little bang things but I feel like I have almost made it worse <laughs> because I feel like they're the greasiest part of it. I can also do this which is kind of cute actually. So we'll see how how these hang <laughs> throughout the episode. I am wearing today my nurtured sweater which is a pattern by Andrea Mowry. It is out of loop yarn which is a really cool yarn that's like two colors twisted together and it looks really nice in this pattern. I knit this last year for Rhinebeck 2022 and my notes are all in the project page but I would suggest adding length to the armholes because these are pretty tight arms. Once you wear them they get a little bit better. I also couldn't tell what was the front or back of the sweater. I need to start putting something in like an extra loop of yarn or something to help me tell the difference because some patterns are more obvious. You can see maybe some short rows or that the back is higher than the front, but I really couldn't tell today. So I might also be wearing my sweater backwards. <laughs> oh, well, there is going to be some prizes given away in this episode. I'm going to share them in this episode, but you'll enter through the comments and I will share them in the next podcast, which will be in a couple of weeks. It is all things that I received in my goodie bag from Vogue Knitting. I promise it's really great yarn. And we're kind of making this like a 30,000 subscriber giveaway. So that will also be in the news segment. Okay, I think that's everything we need to know to get started. I actually have a brand new project that I started and finished between this week and last week's episode. So let's get right into it. I have a brand new project, like I was just saying. It is in this really cute bag that was given to me by a viewer at Vogue Knitting Live, so thank you. I'm already getting tons of use out of it. So I have knit and finished, cast on and finished, a set of mini yarn cozies. This is uh, one of my patterns. It's under Love and Stitches or Knitty Natty or I'll have the project page link down below. But these are little cozies that are meant for 50 gram cakes. So I wanted to make a set so that I could use it for my sock projects. I have made a ton of cozies, especially writing up this pattern and making samples and things, but I actually only had one set of 50 gram yarn cozies and they're currently in use on one of my sock projects. But I noticed that they were, um, well, as I used them, the, the yarn was kind of spilling out of the top. And so I wanted to experiment with lengthening the pattern by just a little bit. So, oops, I just noticed a mistake in here. <laughs> Let's see if you can spot it. I'm putting it right in the center of the screen. Three, two, one. Did you see it? <laughs> There's a pearl bump here in my, in my knit column right there. That's all right. I'll tell you why that is there. I mean, obviously I could have made that mistake at any time, but I know exactly why that's in there because 
I cast these on this weekend to work on during the movies. So we knew that we were going to see the new Marvel movie, the Ant-Man movie, and then we also decided we were going to see another movie over the weekend. We have a one of those like you pay for the month and then you get to go to like three movies a week if you want to which we never go to that many but we try to go to at least two movies per month to make that pass worth it it's a really fun thing to do and our theater is not far away from here and i didn't have any theater knitting i'd finished my muscle burrow hat which is a really great project for in the theater on the part when you're just going around and stock a knit i've also been doing this for a while knitting in the dark so i can now rib in the dark it's not as easy, and as you can see, mistakes can happen. I do check through afterwards, but I guess I just missed that one. Oh well. Um, but if you can start to practice like at home, looking away from your knitting and just trying to do a couple of stitches, then you can eventually work your way up to knitting in the dark if you want to, um, which I don't know many knitters or crocheters who don't want to knit more. <laughs> so it's really fun to have something to do while you're in the theater. So this is a great project for that. So this is the first one that I made. I cast this one on on like Wednesday, I think, and I just did the bottom, which is a set of increases to get you to the stitch count that you need. And then I did a couple of rows to establish the rib pattern. And then I set off into the theater and did most of this actually like during the movies. And then of course the i cord bind off I did later when I got home. And then when I realized we we're going to a second movie on Saturday, I cast this one on, did the increases, and then worked through most of the ribbing in the movies. I added about a half of an inch onto the pattern. And once I get to use these and test them and see like, first of all, making sure they're not too long now that they help and work, I will be adjusting the pattern if I feel like that is a good move. And so if you have the pattern through Ravelry, you'll get an update from me, but this might not be coming for a while because I need to use them first and test them. But I wanted to do a different color bind off because other than that, these are two identical cozies. And I find that I like having something to distinguish the two like sets of yarn that I'm working on. So I'm knitting a pair of socks, either the yarn has come split into two 50 gram skeins or I've split it myself so that I can work on both socks like kind of in tandem, maybe the cuff of one, the cuff of the other, the leg of one, the leg of the other, whatever I'm doing. But it's nice to kind of have something that says like, hey, this is sock number one, this is sock number two. I don't know why, I guess it doesn't really matter. And you could obviously look at the knitting on the sock, like how much have I done on each one. But for me, it's kind of nice to have a little distinction between the two. So if you're gonna add a contrast I-cord to it, just make sure you work the last row before the I-cord, which is a decrease in this pattern, in that color first, and then you can do the I-cord. So these came out super nice. I really am happy with them. Now I had some trouble figuring out what yarn this is. So let me show you what I got here. Um, okay, so first of all, this is the yarn that I used. Before I started on it, it was a, let me make sure I get the numbers right. I'm trying to really keep track of like yarn usage in my project pages and especially for like this whole scrap free 2023 that I'm doing. So this was a scrap from a shawl that I made. We'll talk more about that in a second. So it was 25 grams. The first one with the I cord in the same color took nine grams out of this. And then this one also took about nine, like nine grams in total, but like also about nine grams from here. I don't know how much of the purple it actually used. And so out of 25 grams, I'm now left with a seven gram scrap. So this yarn, I love the color, like, come on, it's so good. I am now feeling satisfied that I have used it down to the best of its capabilities and it's time for it to go in my magic knot ball, which I keep forgetting to bring over. So you know what? Let me grab it real quick. So this, is my magic knot ball. If you look closely, you can see the purple yarn that I used for my muscle burrow and I had two grams left over added in here. <laughs> um, so what I will do is I will find the end, outside end of this magic knot ball. Oh, hold on. I tucked it in right here. And then using a magic knot, I will tie this in and then I'll wrap it around the outside of the ball. So this ball just holds all kinds of different small scraps and bits and leftovers, and one day it will be something cool. We don't know what it's gonna be yet. It's just a really good way to like 
already have all my little scraps in one place <laughs> ready for me. So that's where that's gonna go. But back to the yarn. I knew that I used this yarn in a shawl of some kind, but I couldn't figure out which one it is. And I've got some pictures here and I would love your help. Okay, so I either used it for my slip extravaganza or my texture time. Both of these are shawls by Stephen West. I knit one in 2020 and one in like 2018 or 2019. So this yarn has been around for a little bit, but I was getting it confused with another very similar yarn. <laughs> so see this one, and here's this one. So I'm pretty sure that this one, well, one of these is, um, what is it? I think I have pictures of these two, but like of the yarns that I was using. So for the texture time, which was over here, right? I used um, Stranded Dye Works Pinata. So you can see it here in the set of yarns, right? <laughs> and then, okay, keep that up. And then over here, I knit with my Slip Stravaganza Suburban Stitcher Bang Bang, which you can see in the set here. And they look really similar, right? I feel like the pinata is a little more pink and the bang bang is a little more like light and orangey, which is why I think this is bang bang and this is pinata. There's also a chance that one of these is like neither of those. I don't really know. So this is definitely the yarn that I used for these. I think this is um, Stranded Dye Works pinata, which is what I have tagged in the project page, but just know that this could be maybe not right. I also don't know if, if that yarn is being made anymore. However, the Suburban Stitcher Bang Bang is being made still, I believe. So if you like this color, it's a really fun color. It's not, it's not coming off as well in the camera because it's a little lighter, but it's so pretty and like peachy and pinky and light. Um, then I also found, I tried, was trying to help myself here. I am using currently actually on the next project that I'm going to show a yarn cozy that I think is this, but it also looks kind of different, right? But also this is crochet. So I don't really know. I was just having a hard time. Like I was going through my Ravelry project pages. I was going through my items. This is why I think that what I'm trying to do from now on is like use scraps as I finish things and like go ahead and decide like, am I gonna use it for something else or am I gonna put it into something because I don't know why it matters to me, but I would like to know what this yarn is. So tell me what you think. Do you think that this yarn is, and we can put these up again, the, <laughs> the Stranded Dye Works um, Pinata or Suburban Stitcher Bang Bang? And I haven't reached out to you, um, either one of these dyers to ask them. Um, so I feel like I could ask Diane, Suburban Stitcher, if she thinks this is her yarn or not. <laughs> so hard to tell. Um, but anyway, let me know your expert opinion on these and uh, definitely would recommend Yarn Cozies for a quick weekend project. Next up, I have put some work into my sweater. It's in this beautiful bag by Krista Jekyll. It is Krista Jekyll. Very cool bag, very great shape. I really like this thing. I have already said that it's like a great bag to take around with you because it's got long handles, but this weekend I got to actually put that to the test and I carried it with me all the way, walking a mile to knit group. <laughs> so it is, I think it is proven now that this is a great bag to take around. Okay, let's look at the project. So this is the Citroen, Cit Citrine, I never know how to say this, Citrine Light by Emily Green. It's a beautiful, simple sweater with twisted rib. So it's got this lovely texture on the shoulders, twisted rib in the neck, it'll have twisted rib at the bottom. The sleeves are twisted rib, except I may not be doing them that way. Um, but this yarn, oh my goodness. Um, the yarn is, this is this one I know for sure. The yarn is Magpie and get in focus here magpie um dyed in the skein and the colorway is fior di latte 
There we go, now it's focusing. And I've got four skeins of this, and I have just entered into my second skein, which I've got here in that yarn cozy I was showing earlier. This is a, one of the crocheted ones. It takes a little more yarn. I also cannot do it in the dark. <laughs> so this week, I have made some really good progress into making it really look like a sweater. When you saw it last week, it was not joined at the underarms yet, and I had only just finished, I think, the left front. I had like this much on the left front. It wasn't connecting across the um, neckline yet. So I have my little marker up here and we are celebrating Mardi Gras this week. I mean, kind of. I'm celebrating by using a King Cake stitch marker. Yay. I'll probably switch it to something else now. I feel like it's um, after Mardi Gras, it's time for spring. <laughs> I don't know. It's almost March, so it's time for like, flowers and things like that, right? I've had a long winter. Um, so I worked the right front and then I, following the pattern, I'm not making this up, cast on stitches to connect the two fronts, worked the front down until it matched the back and then cast on for the underarm. This is a pretty basic top-down sweater uh, type of construction, but lots of really cool things in here from the designer. I made sure to use my light bulb stitch markers to help me match the front and the back. So um, that marker didn't really come in handy, but this marker is the marker that told me I was done with a stitch pattern that I was working. There was a certain part in the pattern that happened on both the front and the back where you're working a stitch pattern. And when you finish that stitch pattern, you then knit to the length you need for the armhole. So I marked that on both the back and the front. You can see here it's marked on the back, right there, and here it's marked on the front, and then I was able to count rows. Is that the right spot? Yeah, I think that's the right spot. I was able to count rows, so I knew on the back that I had worked eight rows past that pattern point. So in order to match it on the front, I worked eight rows past that pattern point. And of course I double checked too. I'm like, okay, are these the same? Are they lining up? But I just find rows to be more accurate than measuring to make sure you match front and back pieces. So those are all lined up and matched up and then cast on for the underarm. So it's looking really good. I am happy I, I have been Knitting a size two, I know it looks tiny. <laughs> it looks like a little like child sweater, um, but I have my stitches on a size 24 needle. So they're pretty bunched up. I really don't like to have my needle like too large. Like it really bothers me. I feel like I have to keep moving and moving my stitches, but when they're all like on there together, it's a lot easier to work. So I try to use the smallest needle circumference possible. So 24 inches. So it is pulling in a lot, but it's a decent, size sweater. I actually did do a try on before I attached for, actually, was that before I worked the front? I did a try on at some point. I've got a picture here that you can see of me putting it on. The neck hole fits. I've got it over my shoulder. It's looking like it's working out like where it's supposed to be and everything. So that was kind of a preliminary try on. I definitely need to do another one now that I've worked about an inch of the underarm and like see is it actually fitting so it's very important it's something that i've avoided in the past because i don't like in the back of my mind i don't really want to know if it's not fitting because i don't want to fix it <laughs> but then i realize that that's silly because if i'm going to fix it and make it the right size for me which is obviously something that i want to do i want to wear this better for me to do it now than when i've already knit the entire thing so i need to do that that's on the to-do list for like the next couple of days. But first, I wanted to do the neckband. And I was about to join in my second skein of yarn. So I figured before I join the second skein of yarn here in the body, let me use that skein that I already have caked up to go ahead and do the neckband, then I'll attach it to the body and keep going. This is just, I think, better for my yarn management because I am gonna be short on yarn and I'm gonna have to kind of make some decisions. Do I make the body a little bit shorter? Do I um, make the sleeves and stockinette instead of twisted rib? I'm gonna have to play with these things and try to figure out what to do. But something that is a non-negotiable is having a neckband. <laughs> so better to go ahead and put that in now. Plus for trying on purposes, I think it will make it easier to see if things are fitting. So the yarn, it is so round and so swishy and like so buoyant. 
I think it just looks amazing in this twisted rib. I think it's just popping out so nicely and so crisp and so beautiful. So I'm really liking how this looks. So two cool things in this um, neck band, one that was brand new for me. I don't remember what it's called. It's some kind of like braid, um, not like the Latvian braid. It's a different kind of braid, but it is very subtle. It's here along the bottom of the neck band. You can see it more actually, there we go, right here underneath these stitches where they kind of look like sideways stitches, stitches that are laying down all the way across here. The way you did this, it was explained in the pattern, was like you kind of ca you cast out a stitch and then you kind of did cables basically all the way across where you just twisted two stitches around each other and they made that sort of braid pattern. But the reason that we did it is that on the top of both of the sleeves, you can see that kind of sideways stitch going there. It's also across the back of the neck because we had it in the cast on. So to match, we did it across the front. And I wasn't gonna do it at first. One, it was late at night. Two, I didn't really, couldn't really see it as well in the pattern photos. I think it stands out more in this yarn than the yarn that was used in the pattern. But I thought, you know what, let's try something new. And I did it and I'm really happy that I did because it looks quite cool. It also created a million ends. So I have five ends. <laughs> and I mean, the braid only created two more, but I have five ends on the neck alone. So after I'm done trying this on, if I determine that it's fitting me well, I'm gonna go ahead and tuck in all of these ends. I feel like there's nothing better than working on a sweater that looks like a sweater that's finished at the top. So I'm gonna weave in as many ends as possible on here for sure. So that was really cool. And then the other thing that's a nice detail is that I did, according to pattern, but I did the um, tubular bind off, which just looks so nice. It's a bind off that's like very um, rounded. It's a sewn bind off. It's decently stretchy, but it just has a really nice finish for ribbing. And I think it just looks, this yarn is just making things look super nice. Like, look at this. Looks like a store-bought sweater. I'm really excited about this. So as far as next steps for this sweater, I'm now working on the body. It has really lovely rib down each side. The um, cast on underneath the arm was a lot of stitches, a lot more than is kind of typical for sweater patterns. At least it feels like to me. It looks like a lot, but maybe it's not a lot. I need to try it on. But the armhole is looking decent, right? Not little itty bitty, looks like a real armhole. <laughs> so body size two, armhole size three, it's a size up and I determined this from measuring other sweaters and looking at the schematics, but where was I? I feel like I went off on a tangent. Um, next steps for me, I'm just working on the body, which is just round and round, keeping this stockinette and the twisted rib um, until it's basically my desired length and there's rib on the bottom. So I am going to be trying this on next, probably without going any further on here because I have enough on the underarm to try it on, have it be like under my arms. Of course, it changes a little more when you get more weight on the sweater, but it will be a good determinant if things are fitting me well. Like if the shoulders come in right here, then something is wrong. <laughs> so I will try this on and I will get a picture and, and post it on Instagram. Um, if I try it on before the podcast posts, then we'll put the picture right here and you can see if it's fitting me or not. And then I will probably work through most of this skein of yarn in the body. And that will leave me with two yarn, skeins of yarn left. Now, sleeves. <laughs> sleeves of a sweater are always, especially, I'm talking about long sleeves. Long sleeve sweaters are always like, what's the right word? Deceptive, because you feel like sleeves shouldn't take that long or that much yarn. But really they're like a third of the sweater when they're long sleeve, they take a lot of yarn. And with a twisted rib, it's gonna take a really lot of yarn. So hard to say how much this one skein of yarn, which has only been used for the neck and then I just joined it in, um, how far it's going to get me, but I would say maybe like that much. <laughs> so not all of the body, right? I'm going to need more than one skein of yarn for the body and especially the twisted rib on the bottom. So 
if each of my sleeves uses a skein of yarn, I will be wearing a super crop top, which is not something that I want. So I think that once I finish the skein for the body and I see how long that has gotten me on the body, I might go ahead and do my sleeves. And one for yarn management to kind of make sure I have long enough sleeves, then I can kind of play with the body. If it's a little shorter than I would have maybe originally made, whatever. Um, but I don't want to like not have sleeves, <laughs> like that would be a problem. So yeah, anyway, stay tuned. I also think it's really nice to have the sleeves finished before you finish the sweater because then you're just done. I don't know. We'll see. It's going to be a couple of weeks before I see you on the podcast again. So I'm really hoping to have a ton to show you in the way back crazy part of my mind. This sweater is done because it is getting to almost spring. We're like a month away from spring, but like I want to finish the sweater, wear it a few times and then say, all right, no more sweaters for a little while. I'm going to make like tanks and other things like that. Um, but that's why I want to get it done. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going from here. You'll see it again in a couple of weeks, but if you want to see more progress, just make sure you're following me on Instagram and you'll get to see this baby every single day. That brings us to my last project here, my scrappy granny square blanket. Are you ready to see? First of all, look at this. No yarn attached. I am not all the way done, but I am done joining squares. I am just thrilled. Um, I don't know, you know what? <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to really like fully show it. I will be showing a picture here in a minute, but it is all done and joined in. The whole thing has 96 squares. Um, it has 12 squares tall and eight squares across. It has this lovely neutral colored border all the way around. And where I had to join in my second skein, I've woven in those ends and I just have this one end. This continuous join is, oh my gosh, so good. Um, I couldn't recommend it more highly. And the tutorial that I used is linked down below. It's also linked in this project page. I'm going to be doing a border soon and I will have a tutorial, the tutorial that I follow linked for that as well. So if you have any questions about this project, there might be an answer in the project page, or you can post a comment on my project page and ask me and I will do my best um, to help you out. So backing up a little bit, these squares um, I crocheted over the past four years. Not, I didn't crochet any in 2022. I did them from 2018, wait, 18, 19, 20, and 21 um, in December, Advent season. And then I took a year off. <laughs> I didn't want to make any more squares. I was like, I'm done. I know I have enough squares, but I'm not like quite ready to put this together. And so I put it together. <laughs> it's together. And I did it in like 17 days or something like that. I started on February 3rd and I just finished on Sunday, which was February like 20th or 19th or something like that. So I'm really very proud of myself. So I used this beautiful yarn. This is Moonglow Yarn Company in her sock base. And I've got the colorway right here. Hold on. Oh, here it is. Moonglow Yarn Company. And the color is Cottonwood Breeze. It is such a great joining color. I also use this color to put together a rainbow sweater. And it's just, it's, it's just the best. Like it looks so beautiful with these squares. I mean, does it not? It's so good. So the blanket's not quite done, but right now it is a decent size. It's not as big as my other blanket that I finished in January, where it's like the whole top of a queen size bed. This one kind of fits in the, I would say like three quarters of my queen size bed, but I do have a picture of me wearing it where it's like wearing it. Um, I have it laid out on my lap and it goes from, it covers my feet, it comes all the way up to my lap and I have like a little bit of extra. So this is a perfect lap blanket that is actually big enough to cover the legs, but it's not gonna be one that you would like sleep with. It's not quite that big. 
still a really good size. And when I'm done, done, done <laughs> with it, I will get some measurements and put them in there. Um, but for reference, each square is about four to four and a half inches. There is a little bit of variation just because I knit them or crocheted them over so many years. Um, but for the most part, it all looks pretty uniform. I don't think you can tell anymore which are like the smallest squares. I mean, maybe you kind of can. I could tell when I was putting them in, but just like looking at it, I can't tell anymore. So I am so happy with this. So next up, I am going to be adding a border. So this is Moon Glow Yarn Company Wild Orchid. Oh, and before I show you, tell you any more about the border, I had three skeins of this yarn and this is the second of them. So I used up an entire skein. I used 60 grams of this skein. There's 40 grams left and I still have a whole other one left. So I way overestimated what I needed, which is good. I feel like I'd rather have extra than not have enough and then have a yarn not in the same dye lot. So that's really good. Hopefully that will kind of maybe give you an estimate if you need to figure out <laughs> what how much yarn you need for your project. So I'll be um, updating that on my project page as well. I'm probably just going to skein this up, put these yarns together and hold on to them for future use. Um, I don't know, I could, I could use them for something else possibly. So then I have three skeins of this and I definitely won't need three skeins for my border. I want to make a decent size border, but I don't want it to be so big that it kind of overtakes the project itself. So the whole blanket already has one row of Cottonwood Breeze on it. That's just because, you see it, there we go. One row of Cottonwood Breeze, that's really not a good, there we go. So one row of Cottonwood Breeze all the way around and that's because each of the squares have one row of Cottonwood Breeze all the way around. So what I'm thinking right now is that I will do maybe three or five rows of this color. I was thinking about using the two together, but I don't think they're like that special together that they really need to be used in the border together. I think the neutral is so beautiful the way that it is. And then I just want this to kind of outline it and top it off. There are some fun border patterns that could be done, but I really want to keep the tradition of the granny pattern going. So I think I'm just going to do the granny pattern. Now, when you do the first row around the blanket, you have to do something special like right here where each of the squares are joined. And I think it's basically a decrease. I um, watched a tutorial like when I first started the blanket to kind of see what to do. And I'm gonna go watch it again before working the first round. So I will have that tutorial linked to my project page just in case again, that you're putting together one of these blankets. So I need to wind this up today and get started on it. My plan is to finish this blanket in February. I've still got a few days and I've got more than a few days. I've got like, <clears throat> sorry, I guess I get technically have a week, but we are going out of town on Monday. Today is Tuesday. So I have like five days to get it finished, but I'd really like to get it finished in the next few days so that I can go ahead and wash it and have it totally fresh and done before we leave on our vacation. We have some awesome questions from our viewers today. If you have a question for me, something that has been like burning that you want to ask or that kind of comes up as you're watching an episode, make sure to leave a comment below, but at the beginning put hashtag question. That just helps me find it so it doesn't get lost in the other comments. And then I look through all of them and pick some to answer in each episode. So. I may be answering your question today. The first one we have is from Annette. Number one, how do you stay motivated to finish a project? I usually start strong and make good progress, but then reach a point where it feels like it will never end. Number two, when you knit the movies, do you use a light or just knit in the dark? Okay, let's start with the first question. So I can totally relate to losing motivation on a project. I think that probably many of us that are knit and crochet can relate to this. You may also get to a point where you feel like you've lost knitting mojo altogether. I've heard it described that way. My, I've lost my mojo. And that would be more of a feeling of like having no interest in any of your knitting and crochet projects. So let's start with the 
losing motivation like on a singular project and what things can help. So for example, on my citrine light, um, my sweater, I was so excited to work on it. And I was excited because I was doing new and different things every single day on the different parts of the sweater. Then once I joined it in the round and I'm like, oh, now I'm just gonna knit forever, kind of lost a little, like for a second, lost a little bit of motivation on it. But it happens like in a deeper sense in other things too. But what I did for this one is I tried doing different things on the project. So the instructions say work the whole body and then at the end do the neckband. But that's just because the instructions need to be written in sections. It doesn't really mean you have to do it in that order. So my first tip for you is if you're losing motivation on a project and there's something different to do on that project, do that. <laughs> so if you're working on a sweater, maybe knit a sleeve if you're getting stuck on the body. Maybe knit a neckband. Maybe stop and weave in some ends. If you're finding that weaving an end sounds more appealing than knitting, that's because you're losing motivation on your project. And that's okay, it happens. So that's one of my tips. Um, my other tip for like kind of just making the project feel fresh and feel different is to um, change out your project bag, your progress keepers, um, don't change your needles because that will change the project, but like change a few things about the project. And sometimes that helps make it feel a little fresher and more exciting to work on. Um, if those things aren't really working, then I would definitely suggest just taking a break from the project. Take a planned break. So planned being you decide that you are taking a break from the project and you, you know, you can decide an amount of time, three days, one week, one day, whatever. And in that time that you've planned for your break, you don't feel guilty at all for not working on the project. <laughs> because I feel like sometimes we maybe take a break from a project that's unplanned, done that before, and every single day we're not working on it, we feel guilty. So if you decide, hey, this sweater, I'm bored, I don't wanna work on it right now, I'm setting it aside for a week and then I can decide what I'm going to do, goodbye, it's decided, then you can guilt-free work on other things that are exciting you at the moment. And that's, I think, a really good place to be. When you come back to the project after that amount of time, or maybe, you know, you decide you need to take a week break, but after two days, you're like, actually, I do want to work on it. <laughs> when you come back to that project, you can kind of, um, you have the space to decide if you want to continue working on it or look at things more um, objectively, like, okay, why am I not wanting to work on this project? Is it because I feel like it's not fitting me right. I'm not liking the yarn. I'm not liking the pattern anymore. The color doesn't suit me. I'm making it for somebody that doesn't deserve it. <laughs> you can kind of, um, with taking a break, I think you get the space to make better decisions about what you're working on. And, you know, working on knitting and crochet projects is different for everybody. We all have different things that motivate us. Some people like to um, just pick up whatever feels good. Some people like me really like to make progress on their projects. And when we're not making progress, like that's less fun and that's okay too. So take a break from it. You can kind of see how you're feeling. And then my one other thing, so many of them, um, is 30 for 30. 30 for 30 is just a commitment to a project. So after you've done these other things and you're like, okay, this sweater or this blanket or whatever, I do want to make it. I do want to finish it and it's still driving me crazy. I need to make a plan. I would suggest working on it for 30 minutes a day for 30 days. <laughs> 30 minutes a day, go ahead and do it, like designate a time. Maybe it's the morning, maybe it's the afternoon, maybe it's like the first half hour of when you sit down in the evening to knit or crochet and watch your TV shows. Decide on a time, do it for 30 minutes and stop and put it away and work on your other things. Don't keep going because you're like, oh, I did 30 minutes, I should just keep going. Stop, put it aside, start on the next thing that you're liking to work on and just do this for 30 minutes a day. As you keep chipping away at it, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, you're not only showing yourself, hey, look how much I can get done in just a short amount of time per day, you're getting closer to the finish line, which for most of us motivates us to actually finish the thing. And you're building trust in yourself. Like, hey, I did 30 minutes. I can do 30 minutes again. I can do 30 minutes again. I'm somebody who finishes the projects that I want to get done. I'm somebody who does things more easily. 
and it just really helps. So <laughs> I know that was a really long-winded answer to your question, but I've seen this come up. Um, actually, somebody else has asked this question in my membership lately about losing mojo, and the biggest thing I think with knitting and crochet is like, it's supposed to be fun. So if you're really having to force it, like the 30 minutes a day for 30 days is a strategy to kind of get through the parts that are boring. There's parts of that in every project. But if you're having to force yourself to work on something, I think really look at why you're working on it in the first place. And maybe it's something that needs to be um, ripped out and start something fresh and new. As for your second question about using a light in the movies, no, I do not use a light in the movies. I would not use a light in the movies. It will be super distracting to everybody else. Um, we went to the movies twice this weekend and in one of them, somebody was on their phone the whole time. I can't even tell you how bright a phone is in a dark theater. A neck light even pointed down is extremely bright and please, don't do that in the movies. Um, so I do knit in the dark. I make sure to pick projects that are suited for knitting in the dark. Um, and like I did the yarn cozies this past weekend, that worked out perfectly. Usually stockinette is a lot better because then you don't have to worry about keeping a pattern repeat in your head. When I was doing the yarn cozies, it's a knit three purl one. So in my head the whole time, I was literally one, two, three, purl one. One, two, three, Pearl one, and I would never stop in the middle of like a knit pattern. I always got to the end, one, two, three, pearl one. And then if something does happen and I get off, I just sit there and I wait until there's a bright spot in a movie and I look real quick and then I can get back on track. And another thing you could do is have two projects. So like if you drop a stitch or feel like something's wrong, you can just pick up your other project and merrily work away on that. The goal is to like, don't be distracting <laughs> to others so that we can all keep knitting in, in the movies and everything. So I hope that that helps answer your questions. Question number two. This one is from Caroline. I'm loving the extra long podcasts, Natalie. Thank you. Do you have a monthly budget for buying slash rescuing yarn and yarny things? Okay, I love the way that you phrase that as rescuing yarn. Yes, yarn sometimes does need to be rescued from the shelves and brought home to be loved by us, right? Um, I don't actually have a budget for yarny things. That would be a really good idea. So ever since I went full time in Nitty Natty, I haven't had a yarny budget anymore. Things are a little different now because materials like needles, yarn, and patterns are now part of my business. So things have changed a little bit on that. Doesn't mean that I don't need a budget. I really should look into that a little more, but it means that the budget has changed because it's not just like a, a hobby or anything for me. It's also a way for me to create my business and my content and all of those things. But when I was not doing this as a full-time job and I was still doing Nitty Natty, I did have a budget, a monthly budget for yarn. It did vary, but like it was minimum, it was like a set thing for a month. So in, um, I think it was like 2020, um, we were definitely having to cut back on a lot of things. We had a big change in income and we were like, you know, financially, we had to keep things really, really tight. But I knew that it was important to still have something that I could enjoy and love. And that's where budgeting is so great and helps you to still have that sense of control. And I mean, not just a sense, you have that control. So my budget then was $50 a month for yarny things. So if you think about it, that's a pretty good amount of money. You can really get quite a lot. You could grab, you know, a $30 hand dyed skein of sock yarn and maybe some needles, or maybe you could get two $25 skeins of yarn, but you're not getting a sweaters quantity. Um, at least, well, you probably could actually, maybe from Knit Picks, their yarn is really great if you catch a sale or something like that. So it was actually a pretty good amount of money and it really kept me happy. I also had a large stash then, so that was keeping me supplied with yarn and everything, and that was really, really great. But I wasn't buying any big things. Um, so if I wanted to buy a sweater or something like that, I would maybe save two months worth of that budget so that, 
you know, oh, okay, I'm not gonna buy anything this month, next month I have $100, I can get a sweaters quantity, etc. So that worked really, really well for me then. And I also would save in advance for any shows that I went to. So when I lived in Texas, I always went to DFW Fiber Fest. And I remember the second time I went, because the first time I went, I think I spent a lot of money and then I felt really guilty because I really didn't have that money to spend. I was like a second year teacher. Teachers don't make a lot of money. I don't know if you did do that or not but i especially didn't make a lot of money in my first and second years i was paying for certification anyway too much background information but the second year i went to dfw fiberfest i knew that i didn't want to feel that way so starting six months before i saved a set amount of money i think it was a hundred dollars each month and i didn't buy very much other than that it was like okay we're not buying things because this is coming up and i'm going to save a hundred dollars a month Maybe it was five months in advance because I think I saved like $500 or something, which it's a lot of money to spend at a yarn store, but it's also like goes really fast, right? If you've been to one of those shows before, you know how fast that can go. So I saved that money. So for five months, mentally and physically, I was preparing for that. And that is the best memory I have of going to a, um, a yarn show, feeling like one so proud of myself. This was in my early mid early 20s so feeling so proud of myself for um being responsible in that way and then also like the freedom that it felt to just like know that i had the money to buy most things that i was interested in felt really really good <laughs> so do i have a yarn budget now no should i yes would i recommend it for most people in most situations sure a budget is not something, I feel like people hear budget and they're like, I hate, I don't want to be restricted. But for me, we budget really, really hard. And a budget is a way to tell your money what to do. That's a Dave Ramsey thing. But <laughs> a budget is a way to tell your money what to do and have that sense of control so that you can get the things you want to get and meet the goals that you have. So food for thought on that. Question three. This one is from Sandra. I love your podcast. Thank you, Sandra. I have a question. I use Ravelry a lot to keep track of my projects, but wonder when looking on your phone or tablet, is there an app you use or do you just open the website of Ravelry in your browser? I'm looking for the easiest and quickest way to keep my projects on Ravelry up to date. Struggling a bit with that now. Thanks for answering and sharing. Okay, great question, Sandra. Got my phone right here. Let me make sure there's not anything any other notifications popping up? No, I think we're good. Okay, so Ravelry does not have their own application to my knowledge. I think there is a third party app that like connects you to Ravelry. I've never used that before. So if you're a user of that and you wanna share, please you know, leave it in the comments. I always love when we can help each other in this community. So I just use Ravelry in my browser. Literally, it is always here in my first browser. So right now I'm shopping for shoes, <laughs> but like Ravelry is always right there in one of my tabs so that it's easy for me to make changes to my projects. I'm someone who likes to update my projects a lot too. And because I take all my pictures on my phone, it's the best place for me to upload new photos. Usually I'll upload a bunch of photos and then I'll go to my computer and like move things around, but I do um, keep track of things on my phone. One tip I have for you though is that you can change the um, view. I actually took a screen recording of this to show. Um, if you scroll all the way to the bottom in your web browser, you'll see that it says something like mobile view, I believe. And you can actually, um, it says disable mobile view. You can actually tap that and it will change to a desktop version. Everything's a little bit smaller, but it will I almost identically resemble what it looks like on the computer, which may be easier to navigate, especially if you've only used Ravelry on the computer before that. And then if you like, uh, actually I don't need this, I wanna change back, just scroll back to the bottom, change back to mobile view. Um, and that may help you find everything that you're looking for. The only thing I will say about Ravelry on the phone is that sometimes when I'm adding photos and it opens up my camera roll, it does this horrible flashing thing. And I know this is something that was brought up when Ravelry made a big change a few years ago. So just a warning, if you are have sensitive sensitivities, that that may be an issue and you might not want to use that photo feature um, on the phone. It doesn't happen like every 
time, but like maybe once a month it happens and it's very bizarre. But usually I can just exit out and then come back in. So I like to use Ravelry on my phone too, and I find it really helps keeping it always open to update things as they happen. Question number four is from Amy. Hi Natalie, I love your citrine light sweater, but I have a question. When you join a new ball of yarn, which method do you use? Do you use the magic knot? I find that joining a new yarn on a delicate project often shows an unattractive lump and I wonder what you do. Okay, Amy, I love that question. That's a really good one. Okay, so first of all, I don't use a magic knot on pretty much anything that isn't like a magic knot ball. Um, I don't think that that's a good technique to use for like sweaters, socks, or maybe anything that's not scrappy because I haven't used it very often and I don't know if I trust it 100%. I know a lot of people say magic knots work great, but it is also something that is kind of visible and probably not a good idea for a lot of projects. Hang on. Okay, so my citrine light. This is actually perfect because I just joined in a new ball of yarn. So here's my citrine light. This is the front of my sweater. This is a very light yarn and a very simple stitch pattern, which means anything that I do here is gonna be super obvious. So when I finished my first ball of yarn, I was right here, like right in the front of the sweater. I finished out the yarn because I wanted to use all the yarn, but then I thought, wait a second, I don't wanna join a new ball in, smack in the front of my sweater or right on the chest because no matter what I do, when I weave in the ends, you probably will be able to see something. So I tinked back until I was at the side edge of my sweater and that's where I chose to join in my yarn. So right here on the first like stockinette part, um, I thought that would be a really good place to join in the new yarn. It would be on the side of the body. I could also weave it into like the ribbing and it wouldn't be very obvious. So you can see right here, this is on the wrong side. That's where I chose to join in my new yarn. I left a tail for the old yarn, yarn, <laughs> a tail for the old yarn, a tail for the new yarn, and I will weave these in later, probably along the ribbed edge so that it doesn't show in the stockinette. So one strategy is to be intentional about where you place the new ball of yarn. Now, most of the time when I join in a ball of yarn, I am just doing like a lay the new yarn down kind of a method. I'm not tying knots, I'm not knitting double, I'm not doing anything special. You can definitely knit over your ends in some cases, but again here on the front of a sweater, I don't want anything doubled up, I don't want to see it, so that was not a choice I was going to make. But I do have a tutorial for knitting over your ends right up here if you want to try out that method. I do use it all the time in shawls and stripes and socks and it is amazing. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to pretend do it. But basically, let's say I needed to join a new thing of yarn. I will just go into my stitch. I will take the new yarn. I don't have a new yarn to actually attach right now. I will take the new yarn. I will leave a tail like eight inches long and I will make a loop. I can't see that because it's white. I'll make a loop like this and I will literally just loop it over the back needle and beat it in. I know that wasn't really a great tutorial, but that's literally what I do. I like lay it down. And then when I come back around to that stitch, I look at it and I see, um, usually it's oriented like open. So I fix it, I put it on the right way and then it's, it's seamless. So where I joined in my yarn, where is it? On this side, I think. Yep. So where I joined in the yarn here, it's right there. You can kind of see it, hold on. You can kind of see how like that stitch is smaller, right? But when I do go to weave in these ends, I will pull on each one and kind of even things up. And I don't think it's super obvious. That one's so loose, why is it so loose? There we go. It won't be super obvious. I'll also like make sure to weave in the ends. I'll like pull them over so it kind of closes any gaps. But that is my favorite way of joining in ends for things that are more delicate, like sweaters and stuff. Last question here, question number five, is from Elizabeth. Actually, we have two questions, one from Elizabeth and one from Jane, but both were kind of similar, so I'm gonna answer them together. So Elizabeth says, hi Natalie, I was wondering if you blocked your squares before you started joining them together, 
on your blanket and congrats on the 30k subscribers thank you and then jane said i'm wondering how you block your muscle burrow hat do you use any pins or just lay it out flat and wait for it to dry i've made two muscle burrows and i love them but i'm afraid to block them so i know these are two different questions but they're both about blocking and i made two different decisions on these projects and i want to share why so first of all my granny square blanket I did not block the individual squares before I joined them together. I know that the this is not best practice. I'm looking for my extra squares. I have a whole let's get this out of the way. I have a whole stack of squares that I didn't use in this blanket. Alright, here we go. Okay, these are the ones that were rejected for one reason or the other, too similar to the others, or just a color that I wasn't fan of, a fan of. Um, but you could take each individual square, wash it and pin it out before assembling. This would be nice, but all of my squares were already pretty similar and I knew that I was gonna wash it at the end. So for me, this was a big waste of time if I was gonna spend hours, hours, washing and pinning these out. I do know that they make these really nifty little things that are like really long pins, maybe in the four corners, you could just like slide, stack the granny squares on top of each other. I don't really understand how that would work because then they wouldn't really get dry if they're all stacked on each other, but that would be one method to use. But I just didn't really feel like it was necessary to have them exactly blocked into shape. So I did not do that and I will wash it at the end and block it all at once. For my muscle burrow hat, I did wet block it, but that was at the end, right? When I was finished with everything. So the way that I block my muscle burrow hats, and I don't have the one, oh, this drawer has been open the whole time. Let me just grab, I'm just gonna grab my, my other one. So the way that I block these is first of all, they look like this. So, you know, whenever you wet block something, you want it in a single layer. In this case, it's a double layer, but this is as few layers as you can get on this. So soak it for 20 minutes in the soapy water, rinse it out if needed. Um, I usually use a no rinse soap, so I just rinse it a little bit. And then I literally lay it flat just like this. I have these puzzle piece blocking things and two of them fit together. And then this lays out literally exactly like this. I just blocked one of these last week. And I, I mean, exactly like this, flat, <laughs> flat like this. And so I'll let that dry. And then after a couple hours, I will come to it and I will flip it over because again, it's double layered. So I want it to get aired out. I might do that a couple times. You will get a slight seam. Do you see that right there? There's a slight seam because when I blocked this, I'm guessing that's where it was flattened. So after it got mostly dry, I actually picked it up off the blocker and I just laid it like over a chair like this um, to try to like combat the seams that are happening. I don't know if you can see that one. But the thing is, is that once you wear this after a couple times, that's all going to go away. So you really don't need to worry about that all that much. So my favorite blocking method most of the time, well, look, you can see the, I don't know if you can tell when in, in the camera, but where I have been wearing it like folded in half is still, the memory is still there in, in the pattern. That's pretty cool. It probably wasn't after I blocked it, but because I put it away like this in the drawer, I've been wearing my new one lately, so I've been wearing this. It's just staying like that. Make sure it's completely dry before you fold it back up again and put it away too. Oh, that's what the seam is for. The seam is from me folding it. It's, it also happens when you block, but if you pick it up before it's completely dry and kind of shake it out, it won't happen too much. So. Unless your muscle burrow hats are made out of something really stretchy like alpaca that doesn't have memory that will just stretch out, I wouldn't be worried about blocking. If they're made of wool, um, you can go ahead and block them, lay them flat to dry, no need to pin it. Okay, if you have any questions for me, make sure to leave a comment down below with a hashtag question in front of it, and I will look out for it in the next podcast. In today's news segment, I'm going to be sharing how you can enter to win a prize. So listen up at the end of the segment for details on how you can enter that. But first, I just want to share what has 
happened this week, what is new this week. So the new video is uh, what's in my bag kind of thing. Inside my knitting bag, all my tools, notions, and things like that, needles, hooks. It was a really fun video to put together and see all of my tools laid out. It really was prompting me to uh, want to get rid of some things, <laughs> some extras, some things that I am not using, but I wanted to invite you as well to share what's in your knitting or crochet bag. So on Instagram, take a picture and then share in your stories or in a post and make sure to tag me and put the hashtag inside my knitting bag or inside my crochet bag and show us what you have in your needles, tools, notions, bag. I think it's just really fun to see like how everyone has similar things or different things and get ideas for different tools. So I'm gonna be posting those all over the next week on my Instagram stories. So you can look out for that little series. I think it will be really, really fun. So coming up next week, we're gonna be out of town. So there is gonna be no podcast next week. So that'll be interesting. Whenever I take a week off from a podcast, I feel like I have so much to show in the next podcast. So you'll get a nice long episode, I'm guessing, after we return from Texas. But instead of having just one video, we're gonna have two videos still next week. So the two videos that you can expect to see are one, preparing for a knitting retreat slash convention slash yarny event. I got a ton of questions from all of you on Instagram and I'm going to share with you all of the things that I have learned from going to different events. Of course, I don't know every single thing about every event, but I'm going to try to share as many tips as I can while packing and preparing to go to Austin next week. So kind of a combo video of Q&A about a specific thing and then also getting ready for that event. Then I have been <laughs> vlogging my entire journey of putting together my Granny Square blanket. So that's all gonna come together, hopefully, not done yet, but hopefully in one beautiful vlog where you can see from beginning to end the entire process of finishing up that blanket in a month. So those will be the videos for next week on Tuesday and Thursday. And then coming up after that, I will be back to my regular schedule. We will be sharing a video from the Knitting in the Hills retreat in Austin, Texas, which is a knitting retreat where I'm gonna be taking classes. It's gonna be amazing. So I'm gonna share a vlog from that, sharing specifically about that retreat. And then we'll be back to our regular podcasting, which is where I will share the winners of the prizes that I'm about to show you. So I know that's a lot. That's like the next several weeks all out laid out in one thing, but um, we had to get planned ahead when we go out of town. So now you know what to expect. Um, there's a chance that on, not next week, next week will be Tuesday, Thursday, just no podcast, but the following week as we're coming back from vacation, um, we're going to be well, I guess it's like a workcation because we're gonna be filming and everything while we have the retreat, but we might be posting on Wednesday and Friday again. So I will keep you posted on Instagram if that is the case. Okay, so upcoming events. I'm going to be in Austin, Texas at the Knitting in the Hills retreat from March 2nd to March 5th. Um, this is a like fully involved knitting retreat where we're all staying in the same place. We're all taking classes from the same teachers. We're having meals together. There are events. It is so much fun. I've been once before in 2020 um, and I just can't wait to go back. I get to bring, um, I mean, I guess I'm not bringing her, but my friend Amy <laughs> that I made up here in New York. She lives in New Jersey, but she's gonna be going. We're gonna be going together. And then I get to see all my Texas knitting friends. I used to live in Texas, so that's really exciting. So I am very excited for my two worlds to kind of come together and also to just go to a knitting retreat and relax. Like Vogue knitting was so fun. It was literally right down the street from me, but I was still coming home every day keeping up the house, working, doing all this stuff. So it'll be neat to like get out of town and go to something and stay at a hotel. Kent's coming with me. Toaster's gonna be staying here, um, but that will be really, really fun. So lots of videos will be coming from that. Uh, the one, oh, two other things, sorry, before I show the prizes. Perfect Fit Socks, my sock course that was 
very popular last year, is coming back. So if you want to find out more, make sure to sign up for the email list down below. Right now, I'm planning to reopen it on Friday, which is tomorrow. So Friday, February 24th. This time, things are a little bit different because Perfect Fit Socks is going to be open for good. So you don't have to stress about getting signed up like right away. I am offering an incentive though, if you do sign up over the next week and all the details will be on the website, but you can get a discount. So make sure to sign up for the email list so that you can get that discount code. And then if you sign up within that week, you will get a little percentage off. Other than that though, Perfect Fit Socks is going to be open for enrollment at any time. What we've done in the past is like had it open for a week and then we went through the six weeks or seven weeks really um, together. Now it's more self-paced, so you can sign up at any time, then you can get started at any time, and you'll get new lessons delivered to you weekly. So if you wanna go ahead and purchase it, let all the lessons get delivered and then start when you want, go for it. If you wanna maybe wait a week or two, and then sign up and then every week I, I will email you. It's set up automatically where I'll email you a new set of lessons. It's still all of the same information, all of the same lessons, all of the same stuff. It's just self-paced and self-guided. This time also there's no live component. So all the lessons were already pre-recorded. I find them actually better that way <laughs> than me teaching live because I get more information in there. All of it's a little more concise, but it's still very detailed. But also, um, excuse me, also there's not going to be a Discord community, but you're not going to be alone. You can still ask me questions in the actual space where we have the course. You can leave a comment, you can send me an email. So I will still be there to support and guide you as needed. So Perfect Fit Socks opens up this Friday the 24th. If you want to get signed up right away and you want a little discount, make sure you sign up for the waitlist email. That is the only way I'm sending out that code. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. One more thing. I am going to be offering one more type of payment plan for Perfect Fit Socks to make it a little more manageable for more people to sign up. So you can pay in full. That's the... Um, that's the best price. You can pay over three months or you can now pay over six months, which brings the price down quite a bit like per month. So again, look at all those options. All the details are down below. Okay, last thing I promise and then we'll get to the prizes. Um, Sock Week 2023 is coming, coming up in July, but I am looking for sponsors. However, the sponsor form is going to close on Tuesday, February 28th at midnight Eastern time. So if you are somebody that makes yarn, bags, stitch markers, patterns, sock blockers, soap, I don't know, any different things that are like knitting adjacent, make sure to sign up through this form. The form is only open until the 28th and then I'm going to be closing it. I'm going to be selecting sponsors because we need to already get to work getting everything prepped so that it's ready to go on sale and then ready to get shipped to you before Sock Week begins in July. I know it seems really early, but it's a long process, I promise. <laughs> so if you know somebody that might be interested or you yourself are interested, the uh, application is down below. Just make sure to fill it out before February 28th. If you click on it after that, it will be closed. Okay, so let's look at the fun stuff, right? The prizes. So I have three prize packs that I've put together and they will go to three different winners. This is open internationally. However, I will only be able to support sending out to two people in the US and one person inter internationally. So as I select winners, I will let you know those prizes. This is just because of shipping costs and everything. So feel free to enter no matter where in the world you are. So last week or two weeks ago, I guess it's been now, when I went to Vogue Knitting Live, they gave us so many amazing, beautiful goodies. Things that I know now may not be something that I'm going to work on because they may not be my colors or whatever, but they're beautiful yarns. And rather than just hold on to them and then look at them and feel guilty about not working with them, I want to share them with all of you. <laughs> so uh, let me show them first and then I'll share with you how to enter. So the first one, this one is the one that I myself individually won, not individually. Several people won, but not everyone got. It was not a swag bag. This was like 
I won it because I was randomly selected <laughs> and won like a centerpiece of the table. So it is from La Vienna May. It's this beautiful pink color. It's called um, Happy Accident Vogue Knitting Live 2023. So I think it's going to be something that only people at Vogue got. So this will be pretty cool. It is a cash merino fingering weight, 75% superwash merino, 15% cashmere, and 10% nylon. There was also these really cute little cards to keep track of your progress and also some washi tape from that says La Bien and May on it. I am putting that together with a, something we got in our swag bag, which is some really fun kid mohair from Mono Style Uruguay, a really lovely green color. There's a little bit of this peach actually in it, so I thought maybe somebody could use these together. So that's prize number one. Okay, prize number two is a little sock set here. So this is a new yarn from Barocco called Vintage Sock. It is, what is this color called? Does it say? It just says color 12023, but I think they have names <laughs> on the website. But it is 52% acrylic, 40% wool, and 8% nylon. So if you're someone who's not super big into wool, this might actually be a good um, base for you. So maybe go check out Barocco Yarns. Um, this is definitely enough to get you a pair of socks. And um, this also includes a download. Let's see, it says, to celebrate the release of our vintage sock yarn, we are sharing a free PDF download of our book, Barocco Vintage Sock. So I'm not gonna use that. So you can use it and I'm not gonna show it on the screen so that we're not sharing it with multiple people. But if you get the sock yarn, you'll also get that free download of the book, Barocco Vintage Sock, which must be these cute patterns here actually and a really cute sticker. And aren't Barocco stickers so cute? Then you'll also get a, however you say these, <laughs> needles, Lika, Lika, um, size one and a half, um, 32 inch needles, which is great for socks and also a really lovely wooden needle gauge and you can measure your stitch gauge. So that is prize pack number two for the sock knitter. Last one here. This is also something that we got in our um, swag bags. It's a really cool um, set of yarns. It's specifically to make, I guess, this cowl, which the pattern is going to be in there, but of course you could do something else with it. And this is from uh, Louisa Robert, I think. So it's one skein of Merino worsted yarn and one skein of Kid Silk Mohair. Aren't these pretty colors? Um, so this one is 100% Merino worsted weight. And I'm trying to look for a color here. I don't see a color name, but does this one have a color name? Guess not, but this is a Kid Silk Mohair. So 75% Mohair, 25% uh, Silk. You hold them together. Wow, it's so blurry, Natalie, very helpful. <laughs> there we go. You hold them together again to make this or something else that you want. So you should have a decent amount there to make something very beautiful. And then also um, a set of Yucalan single use washes. I think there's three of them, four of them maybe in here. These are really great to use to like give as gifts or just for your own, you know, when you finish something and you wanna wash it. So that will be prize pack number three. Okay, so how do you enter to win one of these three prize packs? I am going to ask you to leave a comment and I'm gonna be a little diabolical and get <laughs> get some information um, through this. <laughs> okay, so what I wanna hear from you is in a comment, I want you to tell me a video that you would love for me to create. But at the beginning, just like we did for the questions where you do hashtag question, I want you to put, um, hold on, I just came up with what it was. What was it? Ah, yes, <laughs> I want you to put hashtag video request and then put in a video idea that you have or something that you would like to see me do. 
when you do that, and if you're doing like a question or another comment, you know, you can keep these separate, just makes it easier. But I will be randomly selecting three people in a couple of weeks when I record my next podcast. So you have lots of time to enter, but I will be randomly selecting three people that have put that hashtag video request and then asked for something to be you know, in our, in our content, and I will be sending out these prizes. Again, I can do uh, one international prize and two US prizes, so please um, be patient with me as I figure that out and make sure um, just to, again, fit in within our shipping means. So I'm really excited to see what all you come up with and what kinds of video ideas that you have for me. I haven't asked for video requests in a while. So I feel like I'm definitely needing um, to kind of check in and see like, what kinds of things are you wanting to see and not just making things that are interesting to me and Toaster <laughs> and Kent. Um, so let me know with your video requests and you may just win a prize. I am feeling very lucky because we've had a lot of fun over the last week. So kind of taking things back to last Tuesday, which was Valentine's Day, Kent and I didn't really have any plans because Wednesdays are the night that we go out and try our new restaurants in February. So we just figured, yeah, Wednesday, we'll go out on Wednesday. That will be our Valentine's dinner. We don't really do anything most of the time for Valentine's Day. And then Kent totally surprised me and he got me some Levin cookies. I recently learned it's Levin. I looked this up. I looked at an old interview and it's Levin, not Levain, not Levin, but Levin, I think. <laughs> I need to ask an employee next time I'm there. But anyway, it's my favorite cookie place in New York City, in the world, honestly. It's so good. And he got me six cookies. So I have been totally enjoying those for the last week. Um, he said they could all be mine, which is really sweet. But anyway, he got me cookies, flowers. He also got me a couple of cards, um, one from Toaster, one from him. And he got some cheese and wine, which was amazing. So we enjoyed that while watching um, a movie with the members, uh, my membership. So we already had planned a kind of a Palentine's Day movie. We watched the new Netflix movie, Your Place or Mine with Ashton Kutcher and Reese Witherspoon, which was really cute. Um, really enjoyed that. We, I love doing movie nights with the membership because we use a platform called Teleparty and then you can chat throughout the movie, not verbally, but like chatting kind of like a YouTube live. It's really fun. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. And it was just even better with cheese and the wine and the cookies. So it was a great Valentine's Day. Uh, we went to see Ant-Man Quantum Mania on Thursday. We always like to see the new Marvel movies the day they come out so that nothing gets spoiled for Kent because he doesn't watch any trailers beforehand and he doesn't want to have to avoid the internet for like an entire week. So we just go and see the movies right away. And we had our tickets booked for several weeks. So that was really great and exciting. And that was of course when I cast on my first yarn cozy. Gosh, what just came into my eye? Oh, what in the world? Okay, I think I'm okay. Um, but here is a before the movie where I just have the bottom part of the cozy done and here is after the movie. So I think that's the one where I made a mistake. Oh well, <laughs> it's fine. But you can see like you can get a lot done during uh, one of those long Marvel movies. So that was really great and no spoilers, but I enjoyed the movie. Not as great as like the other Marvel movies, but I think just as good as all the other Ant-Man movies, which I did enjoy. On Saturday, I met up with my friends in the New York City Knitting Group, which is a group I found through Meetup, um, which is growing to be huge. I think there was like 60 people there. But on the way there, I met up with my friend Megan at a new to me coffee place called Bibble and Sip, um, which had a really cute logo. They also had amazing looking treats. I mean, just look at these, all of these cute little, um, I think, I don't know what they're called exactly, but there was like tarts and all kinds of stuff, macaroons. It looked really good. I didn't end up getting a treat, but I wanna go back for that. The latte was mm, not the greatest, <laughs> um, at least to me, but I like things that are pretty plain. So um, I think they also had bubble tea. So they had their like pre-made syrups and everything. 
or pre-made like drinks. So if that's something that you like, you might like that place. It was really cool. So we went there and then we went to a, like a public atrium. So in New York City, there's all these spaces that are public areas indoors because you know, people during the week use them to maybe eat their lunch, take a break from work, eat their lunch. Um, but then on the weekends, people just hang out there. And so this was a really beautiful indoor atrium that kind of looked indoor outdoor. You can see there's like trees and glass and everything. So it was nice because it was warm, but it also was like, felt like we were outside, which was cool. It was a cold, cold day. So it was nice that it was inside for sure. Again, there was like, I don't know, 60 people there. It was absolutely incredible and so much fun. I got to meet some new people, talk with people that I've met before, and I worked on my second yarn cozy. So here it is, I cast that one on because I wanted to get that ready for our next movie. Like I said, we try to go to a lot of movies because we're paying <laughs> already to go for the movie pass, so might as well take advantage of it. So right after that, I walked myself down to our local theater and we, myself, Kent and a friend, saw Knock at the Cabin, which is a, like a scary movie, uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie. And I'm not usually into scary movies, but I thought this one looked different and it looked like pretty good. And I would say I enjoyed it. It wasn't like jump scary or like really frightening. Um, it was kind of silly. Like some parts of it were believable and some parts were definitely like really, you know, like when you're watching a scary movie and the dumb teenagers like go hide in a place where they can't get out, like that kind of thing. But I actually really thought it was pretty good. So I enjoyed it and I knit on my cozy. So here's before and here's after. I got most of my second cozy all done. I ended up wrapping up that cozy on Sunday because it was just so close that I just figured I need to go ahead and finish this off, get it done, and so that I don't have a lingering project. Um, and then on Sunday, we mostly spent the day at home. Um, I had to work a little bit, I had some things to finish up, and then we had friends over for pizza, and we tried to watch a movie, but we just ended up talking through it, so we just changed to watching YouTube, and then we weren't really watching that either, so we just chatted, had pizza, I worked on my, um, what did I work on? I think that's when I finished my cozy, worked on my citrine light, and it was a really great night and a great weekend. I felt really, really fortunate to have such a fun week. Okay, I finally finished reading Spare by Prince Harry. I will say it wrapped up pretty fast, kind of like the documentary, if you've seen the Harry and Meghan documentary. I did enjoy the book. It was just a little too long for my taste, but if you wanna learn more about Prince Harry's life and everything that is currently going on with them from their point of view, I would definitely recommend it. I thought it was an interesting read. I started a new book called The Book of Two Ways by Jodi Pico. I am confused. <laughs> so when I first started the book, I wasn't really enjoying it. I am enjoying it more now. I'm about 30% of the way in, and I think I'm gonna continue reading it. But there's a lot of stuff in this book about Egyptology, I think is what it's called. And the main character is a, um, what is it called? She like is a researcher and she's in Egypt and she's excavating in the caves and like uncovering hieroglyphics. And there's a lot of um, academic words <laughs> that are very tricky to read and like making it a little bit hard for me to read. But then I remembered that I recently read Mad Honey by Jodi Pico and the beginning of that book was a hard read too because you kind of had to get into the all the stuff about the beekeeping and like understand a little bit of that and I really didn't need that to be perfectly honest but I'm kind of finding that that may be what makes Jodi Pico very unique and like how she gets very into her subject matter. So now that I'm past like trying to understand all that stuff about the Egyptology, um, I am enjoying the book a little bit more. We're a little bit more into what is actually going on with the character where she is um, examining a part of her life. She's kind of come to a path where she's examining 
different paths that she could be on. So it's actually pretty interesting. I'm going to keep reading it for now and I'll update you later on if I continue to read it. But that's The Book of Two Waves by Jodi Pico. So we watched a lot of movies this week, went to the movies twice. We also watched, um, what was it called? Your Place or Mine, the new Netflix like Valentine's Day movie. That was cute. Other than that, we have been eating up um, Abbott Elementary on Hulu. We are almost done with the second season, which I'm really sad about. I think after that, we're going to go back to rewatch Ted Lasso before the new season comes. I don't know when it's coming out, but I feel like I need to rewatch on all the previous seasons before the new one comes. And then I also started watching a new show on Hulu called Not Dead Yet, which is about a journalist, I guess, or a writer um, that writes obituaries and she can um, the person that she's writing about, the person that has died, is somebody that she can see and interact with and talk with. So it's kind of funny. It's cute. It's like, there's only three episodes or there was only three episodes out when I started it. So I've seen all of those, but it's like silly, lighthearted and cute. And so I'm, I'm enjoying that. I really like the main character and some of the side characters are, are kind of fun too, but it's a silly show. It's not heavy. Um, so it's definitely a fun one and I would give it a watch. Okay, let's wrap up with the intentions for the week. Actually, I want to make sure I share this correctly. So our, um, we, I have four, no, oh my gosh, what am I trying to say? I have three intentions for the month of February. I'll be sharing next podcast episode how everything wrapped up, but... Here it is, okay. Um, there is a personal goal, a business goal, and a yarny goal. And so I'm gonna start with our personal one because this has been the most fun this month. I would so recommend doing this in your town, but we, Kent and I, set a goal to try one new restaurant per week in February. We kind of set some parameters like that we weren't gonna get alcohol out just to kind of keep things um, more budget friendly. And when we first started out, we were, like unintentionally trying new foods, like new cuisines, as well as new restaurants. That wasn't really the first premise, but it did turn out that way. So the first week we went to a Georgian restaurant. The second week we went to an Ethiopian restaurant. A lot of you shared that you love Ethiopian food um, when I shared that in last week's podcast. So that was really cool to like hear the different experiences. And you let me know what that like doughy bread thing was called. I can't remember it now, but if you were curious, the answers are in last week's podcast. So this week we did not try a new to us food, but it was sort of new to me. So let me explain, hold on. I need some coffee for all the talking. Okay, so this week we didn't have a plan. We just walked out of the house on Wednesday night and started walking towards um, one of the avenues that has a lot of restaurants on it. And so we're walking down, we're like looking at different restaurants and I realized that this is a unique <laughs> New York City experience. I don't think you can just maybe go out in every town and walk down a street and find a bunch of restaurants, but I feel like most towns have like a main strip. Um, and I keep saying town, city, <laughs> town, whatever. So we're walking down a street that has a bunch of restaurants on it and we see this place, it is called Dim Sum Palace. And I've had dim sum before. Um, so just in case this is a new um, food for you, this was totally new for me when I moved to New York City. I'd never heard of it before, but dim sum is a Chinese um, restaurant, but it has, dim sum is, is like small plates basically. Um, so small things you order and share, a lot of dumplings, a lot of buns. Um, there's more to it than that. And again, I don't want to like, explain, especially for a culture that is not mine, that I don't have a full understanding of, but I have, we have not been to this dim sum place before, but I've had dim sum once before with a friend who ordered for us. So we thought, you know what, let's go to dim sum like on our own. And that way we can explore a lot of different things that we haven't had before we can order for ourselves, which would be really, really great. So that was good. So we'd already had the cuisine because our friend who was familiar with it, like showed it to us. So that was a great start. And then getting to go on our own made it even more fun. So we went to this place called Dim Sum Palace and I'm literally like salivating. I want to go back <laughs> so badly. It was so good. Um, I took the menu because it's one of those places where you can see 
photos of the food and like check off um, what you want to order. So we ordered in two rounds. We ordered like four or five things, ate those, decided we were still hungry and ordered a few more. Love, love places like that. So, okay. <laughs> the food comes out and it's in all these really, um, these like small like steamer kind of basket things. And it is delicious. My favorite thing is the barbecue pork bun. Their barbecue pork bun was like a cloud. It was this fluffy, I don't know if it's dough is the right word, but it was fluffy, spongy, pillowy, and the barbecue pork, oh my gosh, so good. I, I want to go right now. I just want to go. <laughs> I want to go eat there for lunch. It was so good. It was amazing. So that was one of my favorite things. We also really enjoyed trying a lot of the different dumplings. Um, one of my favorite ones was like a uh, bamboo shoot one. There was mushroom. I mean, oh, they were so good. <laughs> they were so good. We got stuffed there. It was amazing. Um, we also overheard somebody ordering some chrysanthemum tea. And when I was researching like how to explain what dim sum is, cause I just, I wanted to be accurate. Um, Wikipedia, according to Wikipedia, dim sum is typically accompanied by um, drinking tea. So we overheard somebody order chrysanthemum tea. And I was like, Kent, do you want to try chrysanthemum tea? And he's like, I don't know, it's $8. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a whole pot. Okay, let's try it. So we, we got the chrysanthemum tea. And it was great. It ended up being like, we both love tea already. And the tea tasted like pretty good. Like I liked the tea. But it was a good experience like having the tea, the warm tea with the food. And it's just like so fun to try food and like try to understand it and like eat it and in a way that it is meant to be served. Um, as a former picky eater, I'm still kind of picky, but I just have learned that like more exposure to like different foods helps you to enjoy food even more. So my hope with sharing <laughs> some of these foods is that you may the next time you pass by a place that's like dim sum or Ethiopian or Georgian, it may encourage you to go try it out um, when you haven't been exposed to that before. But anyway, tea was great. And then for dessert, we tried the crispy green tea rice ball with peanut paste. And I liked it. It was a really interesting texture and taste. Um, something that I'd had something kind of similar before, but never something exactly like it. So again, so fun to try um, a new dessert, a new cuisine and I literally want to go there right now and I could throw down some of these um, mushroom dumplings. Those were very, very good. So Dim Sum Palace. I'm sure there's lots of Dim Sum places in New York City. I'm, I'm positive actually. Um, so there's another place to try out if you come and visit. Okay, my business goal for the month of February is to design for one hour, two times per week. I am really struggling with this. I have just struggled with like staying consistent on designing knitting and crochet patterns for the past couple of years. And I thought I would really try something that is a tried and true technique for me when I am having a hard time doing something, which is setting aside the time for it and just blocking out that time, creating that bubble for myself and then just working in it. But what has continued to happen for the past two weeks is I get to that design time block and there's something else that takes priority. And so the design time block gets moved to the end of the day and then I don't have time and then it gets moved and then it gets moved and then it just gets deleted off my calendar. And this has happened again. I didn't do any designing last week, not at all. And I'm trying to not beat myself up for it because do I wanna do it? Yes. Why am I not doing it? I need to explore that a little bit more first. Um, I also know that I was kind of getting discouraged about this pattern. So that's part of it too. And I think that's part of like any creative process is that there's like spurts and stops because you're, it's really going well and you're feeling motivated and you're getting the energy and creative ideas. And then something is a roadblock. And for me right now, the roadblock is the way that my pattern is coming out. So let me show, I, I literally haven't done anything else on this, but I, was feeling discouraged because my slip stitch pattern is not showing up nice and crisp like it did on my first sample where you can really see it. 
And so I ordered size zero needles, which is one size down from what I am using now. And when they came in, they were the wrong thing. They were size one and a half needles, which of course is not going to help. So I was able to return them and then order my size zero. Those came in, so that did delay me a couple of days because I felt like I couldn't really work past that. Um, actually, that's kind of a lie I'm telling myself. I could have still worked on the written pattern, but I just didn't. So I think that was part of it. Um, but then, I don't know, I was just feeling a little discouraged, I think, like looking at this and it not going exactly how I hoped it would. But then I saw, when I was reading through the comments from last week's episode, several of you commented and said that it might not be the gauge that's an issue. It might actually be the colors of this yarn um, that because there's all these like dark stripes basically, that it's kind of playing, I guess, with the eye a little bit and it's distracting you, like it's drawing your attention and you're not really seeing the, um, the slip stitch pattern, which I thought was really interesting. So now that I kind of have had some time to <laughs> wallow in self-pity for it not really working out, and I have my size zero needles, I can proceed with one, trying out my other stitch pattern that I started, do that for a little bit, then switch to my size zero needles, see if that changes things. Once I do those two, you know, hypotheses, I can then make a decision moving forward. Do I want to switch the stitch pattern, switch the needles, or decide that this yarn is probably not meant to be for this stitch pattern, make these socks another way, and then get some other self-striping yarn so that I can test my pattern out again. And that is just the creative process. So while no set aside time was done with design this week, there's a little bit of forward progress there with that one. I can already see that because of some of the other things I have going on this week, there's a chance that my design is going to get pushed again. So I don't know. I'm thinking about making design my March goal again, but I wonder if I just need to step back from it, let some things happen naturally, and then approach it again later. So not everything always works out perfectly, <laughs> even when it's a goal. And I want to be transparent about that and share with you the thoughts and things that I'm having. Okay, last thing, my yarny goal was five granny squares per day in February. My overall goal is to finish my granny square blanket. So things were not going great last week. I was definitely behind because of Vogue knitting. But of course, as I showed earlier, I did end up finishing all of the squares in my blanket, but I had to pivot in order to make that happen. So once I sat down and realized, you know, here is the date. I wanted to finish assembling squares on Sunday, February 19th. In order to get to that point, how many squares do I need to do per day? And that ended up being eight, <laughs> a whole row, eight squares across. So from, I don't know, I think it was like four or five days that I did this, maybe five days. I worked, here, there's the top. I worked a whole row for four or five days in a row. Instead of doing five squares, I did eight squares, and that caught me back up to my midpoint, or not midpoint, but like one checkpoint goal of finishing, assembling all the squares on that date. So I have been keeping track here in my notebook. I'm caught back up to where I planned to be, even if the five squares per day didn't go exactly how I planned, and I didn't rewrite my stuff. I just would still mark off, even though it's like five, five square increments, I would still mark off as I finish things and then I got to mark this one off. So now we are in the last week here where I want to finish up the border. Yesterday I finished the, there's like two whole raw edges left on the blanket. I finished those up with the neutral and that means today I can move on to adding, ah, adding, that was weird, adding that pink yarn for the border. So thinking about it, today's Tuesday. I think I'll give myself Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to do the border. And then I can wash it on Saturday. I'm planning to wash in my machine on a cold wash with a higher spin speed to spin out all the water and not drying it this time. I'm definitely gonna put in a color catcher because my border color is dark, my joining color is light. I don't know how these colors are going to behave. So that will be interesting. But again, it's a blanket. I need to be able to wash it. And so we're gonna give it another chance. Well, I'm gonna give myself another chance. The last blanket went in the machine in the dryer. 
that wasn't good. So this one's just going in the machine and I'll let you know how it goes. So this one is going nicely. Overall, I'm really happy with my how my February progress is going. I will again share next podcast in a couple of weeks, um, our last restaurant that we're going to, which is going to be awesome, and kind of what I'm deciding on as far as how I'm going to move my goals into March. I'll pick some new things. It'll be great. Okay, I think that's everything for today's nice long episode. Um, make sure if you do have questions, you comment with hashtag question. And if you want to enter to win one of those prizes, you put hashtag video request and suggest a video that you want to see here on the Nitty Natty channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in two weeks for a podcast, but lots of other videos coming in between.